Well, it's... it's been a while, hasn't it? What's happened since my last Crash Review anyway? Well, I've gotten myself a ton of fans. Hell, I even have my own irate gamer now. Also, some shit happened with Google+. Anyways, I'm back and ready for some more awesome reviews. So I thought I'd start my new reviews by tackling my favorite game of all time. That's right, today we're taking a look at Spire the Dragon. Cue the goddamn intro! I am the Stimpy Man, traveling to parts unknown. Now come with me, join me on my journey to do... THINGS! Away I go! You know guys, it feels really good to be back, especially because we're taking a look at my FAVORITE GAME OF ALL TIME I think I've drawn on long enough. Anyways, let's dive in. But first let me tell you a story. Yeah, before we start, keep in mind that the word favorite is not synonymous with the word best. I'm not saying Spire the Dragon is better than any game out there, I am saying it's my personal favorite. We good? We're good. Spire the Dragon is a classic 3D platformer for the Sony PlayStay developed by Insomniac Games, the same people who would later go on to make Ratchet and Clank. In the game, you play as a dragon, named Spyro. No duh. So we start in the world of the dragons, and an evil creature named Nasty Nork has turned all the dragons into crystals, and it's your job, as Spire the Dragon, to free them. As Spire, you have plenty of moves at your disposal. You can breathe fire on your enemies by pressing the circle button. However, some enemies wear metal armor, which can only be broken by charging. You can charge by hitting the square button, and holy shit is charging useful. Charging makes you move faster, and this is a huge help, as you can cover large areas of land very quickly. You can also cover land by gliding, another one of Spire's abilities. Spyro can glide to cover large portions of the levels, and reach areas that he otherwise couldn't. Being a collectathon platformer, your ultimate goal is to collect the gems scattered throughout the levels. Now having to pick up every stupid little gem would be a real hassle, but thankfully Insomniac prepared. Meet Sparks, who's like Agu of this game. But better. Sparks can pick up gems that are a small distance away from you, and goddamn is that useful. When you get hit by enemies, Sparks begins to lose his color. Getting hit once will make Sparks blue. Getting hit twice will make Sparks green. And getting hit three times will remove Sparks completely, making you lose your ability to grab gems, and also making you very vulnerable. Getting hit without a Sparks will kill Spyro. <laughs> there are other collectibles aside from gems. Another feature are thieves. Thieves will steal dragon eggs and run away from you. You can get the eggs back by chasing them and using your flame attack. Then there are also dragons, a collectible exclusive to Spyro 1. The dragons have been turned to crystals by Nasty Nork, and you can free them by running up to them. After you free a dragon, you can use the spot you freed them from as a save point or just a checkpoint. Whenever you free a dragon, you also get some dialogue from them. Some will give you helpful advice, some will tell you interesting stories, and some will just thank you for releasing them. Thank you for releasing me! 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 Okay, actually, a lot of them do this. Thank you for releasing me! It was a definite selling point back in 1998, but now, not gonna lie, it's... Pretty hilarious. Spyro, my friend, how about a hint on gliding? You bet! Spyro, it's great to see you, but I've got to go. When you see arrows like these, you can charge along with them to begin a supercharge. Supercharge? You start out in the home world, and it's got portals which lead to the other worlds. Something interesting here is that each level can be fully completed on your first visit. You can go through the entire game without backtracking once. This is one of the many reasons this game is my favorite game of all time. There are six homeworlds in this game. Each is home to three levels, a boss, and a flight. The homeworlds are the artisans, peacekeepers, magic crafters, beast makers, dreamweavers, my favorite, and nasty's world. The levels are filled with dragons, gems, and occasionally thieves. Gems are scattered about and also dropped by enemies. To get 100%, you need to get all of the gems. This can be a bit of a pain since these levels get very large, especially later on. 
Something that I have seen too many people run into, and something that I've even run into myself, is accidentally skipping one or two gems, then having to explore every square inch of the level until I find the tiny red gem hiding in the middle of nowhere. Aside from this, the levels are rather easy and a bit lacking in variety. Levels can blend in with each other, a lot of them look the same, and there isn't a whole lot to do in the levels. Although, the game is still tons of fun. Well, obviously, it has to be since it's my favorite game of all time. There are plenty of fun things to do in the levels, despite their lack of variety. The levels are very open and usually have some branching paths, and some cool gimmicks. One thing I always love to do in this game is supercharge. Supercharge? By charging over a booster ramp, you could begin a supercharge. During a supercharge, you'll become invincible, and you'll also build up ridiculous speeds, making it all the more satisfying whenever you nail a supercharge. Spire of the Dragon has a very smooth and steady difficulty curve. There aren't any areas in the game where I feel the game becomes significantly harder than the area before it. But if you compare the first and last level, there's a big difference. The smooth curve is nice, but this can be a bit problematic, as Spyro isn't that difficult. Sure, newer players or younger audiences may see a good challenge, but anyone who's familiar with 3D platformers won't have much trouble with Spire of the Dragon. It has its frustrating bits, but overall, it's pretty easy. A good example of this are the bosses. I don't know, the first couple of bosses are kinda memorable, but really, they're okay at best. The boss levels play just like regular levels, only there are no thieves, less gems, and only one or two dragons. The main attraction to a boss level is a boss, and these can range from being pretty unique to just pathetically easy. The bosses are Toasty, Dr. Shemp, Metalhead, Jacques, and Blowhard. Lastly, we got the flights. A lot of people don't like these, but I really enjoyed them. Well, hey, what can I say? It's only my favorite game of all time. In flights, you fly around in all directions. Up, down, left, right, put your left foot in, put your right foot fucking out. In flights, you gotta fly around and complete tasks in the level. These tasks may be flaming all the trains or flying through the rings. You get gems for completing these tasks, but in order to get 100%, you need to do all of them in one run. A lot of people thought these are unfair, and yes, they took a bit of getting used to, but when you get the hang of them, they're pretty easy. It's not like these flight levels are completely stupid and out of place or anything, no. Spyro has wings. He's a dragon. It works. Even though Spyro the Dragon is rather simple, okay, very simple, it's still my favorite game of all time. Why is that? Is it because you can complete each level in one run? Is it because I'm just so good at it? Is it because it's nostalgic to me? All of these are good guesses, although if I had to pin it down to just one reason, I would say that the definitive feature of this game, to me, is its soundtrack. Spyro's soundtrack is my favorite game soundtrack of all time. I have my definite favorites in Spyro 2 and 3. With Spyro 3, it'd either be Molten Crater or Icy Peak. With Spyro 2, it'd be Sunny Beach. Hell, that's my goddamn intro music. But with Spyro the Dragon, damn! I mean, fuck, guys, there are so many I can't even choose. Dark Desert Town Square, Dr. Shem Toasty, Twilight Harbor, Misty Bog, Alpine Ridge, North Cove, Haunted Towers, Dry Canyon, Beast Maker, Street Tops, Wizard Week, Lofty Castle, Ice Cavern, Cliff Town. That was fucking hard to do. The music was composed by Stuart Copeland, who was also the drummer of the band The Police. Now, I gotta tell you, Stuart's got a way with music. The music to this game is just phenomenal. I feel like I can just see Stewie over there, just sitting down and composing this like it's nothing. Probably because he did just that during an interview with Playstay Underground back in 1898. They pay me for this. There are just so many great songs, and I don't think I'll have to rap a second time to emphasize this to you. Certain songs are iconic and memorable, like the title theme. Then there are ones that are also upbeat and badass, like Wizard Peak, which was later used by Copeland as the credits music to The Amanda Show. This game's music has such a distinct and recognizable style that it's impossible not to fall in love. Hell, the entire game has this unique style, both this ancient but also timeless look that it really doesn't share with any other game. Maybe that's why it's my favorite game of all time. I could say so much more about this game, but there's only so much that I can condense into a single review. This game means so much to me on a personal level. Keep in mind, it's my favorite game of all time. This is just one of those games that I could play over and over and never get tired of. If I was forced to play one game for the rest of my life, I honestly think that this would be that game. Now to answer the age-old question, does Spire the Dragon still hold up? Absolutely. 
nice graphics, open levels, tons of shit to collect, the pleasant lack of backtracking, and the awesome music. This game is just goddamn awesome, and it's my f toasty. <laughs> Thanks for watching this review. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship, so go down there and hit that subscribe button for me. To all the people living in the future, hello! You can click the annotations to see my reviews of Spyro 2 and 3. To all you present day folks, they're still gonna take a bit. Until then, feel free to leave a comment. Love it? Hate it? Let me know in the comments below, just don't be a douche about it. Well, looks like I made this awkward enough. See you next week when I review Spyro 2.